Good morning, church. I welcome you to this fifth Sunday in Pentecost as we gather now to give worship to our Lord as we listen to scripture and sermon and children's sermon and prayers. Uh, I'm thankful you can join me and that we can be together even though we may not be face to face. We are one in the spirit in our hearts and that's a wonderful blessing. So let us begin today with readings. I want to share with you first of all the reading, our very first reading from Zechariah chapter 9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter Jerusalem. Lo, your king comes to you triumphant and victorious is he, humble and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. He will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the war horse from Jerusalem, and the battle bow shall be cut off, and he shall command peace to the nations. His dominion shall be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. And as for you also, because of my, the blood of my covenant with you, I will set your prisoners free from the waterless pit. Return to your stronghold, O prisoners of hope. Today I declare that I will restore you to double. The psalmody for today is Psalm 145, verses 8 through 14. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. Lord, you are good to all, and your compassion is over all your works. All your works shall praise you, O Lord, and your faithful ones shall bless you. They shall tell of the glory of your kingdom and speak of your power that all people may know of your power and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. Your dominion endures throughout all the ages. You, O Lord, are faithful in all of your words and loving in all your works. The Lord upholds all those who fall and lifts up those who are bowed down. And here ends the psalmody for this day. The second reading is from Romans. We've been having more than several of these readings come from the book of Romans. So the Apostle Paul writes to us from the seventh chapter, beginning at the 15th verse. I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now, if I do what I do not want, I agree that the law is good. But in fact, it is no longer I that do it, but sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells within me that is in my flesh. I can will what is right, but I cannot do it. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I do. Now, if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I that do it, but sin that dwells within me. So I find it to be a law that when I want to do what is good, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inmost self. But I see in my members another law at war with the law of my mind, making me captive to the law of sin that dwells within my members. Wretched man that I am, who will rescue me from this body of death? Thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. And now, our gospel text from the 11th chapter of Matthew, beginning at the 16th verse. Jesus spoke to the crowd, saying, To what will I compare this generation? It is like children sitting in the marketplaces and calling to one another, We played the flute for you, and you did not dance. We wailed, and you did not mourn. For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say he has a demon. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, Look, a glutton and a drunkard, 
a friend of tax collectors and sinners, yet wisdom is vindicated by her deeds. At that time, Jesus said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and the intelligent and have revealed them to infants. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal to him. Come to me, all you that are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I'd like to ask now if the boys and girls are present and here, if they gather around the, the screen for just a few moments, I have something to share. I brought a brick. Everybody knows what a brick is, right? Bricks, bricks are heavy. Do you realize that the average brick, and of course they come in different sizes, but the average brick lay or weighs somewhere around three to five pounds. Now that's not all that heavy, and, and boys and girls, I would think if I handed you this brick, if you were here, that each of you would be able to carry it. You would be able to hold it uh, because it's, it's heavy, but it's, it's not too heavy. But what if I were to ask you to take this brick and to put it in your hand and then to take your arm and stretch your arm way out like this? We can't even see the brick now because of the screen, but could you hold that? Could you hold it for a long time? You know, the longer you hold a brick with your arm outstretched, the heavier it gets. Do you think you could do this all day long? I'm not even sure I could hold it out like this all day long because the load gets heavier and heavier and heavier. You know, we have a way of carrying burdens in our lives. Uh, let me give you a few examples things that are heavy, things that are hard to manage, things that are just difficult to have around. Um, maybe a, a heavy burden for you if you're in school would be maybe you're not, you're not, uh, your grades are not as good as you want them to be. Um, you could have a burden within the family, a problem that weighs heavy on you and your mom and dad. You might would even have a, a, a problem, say, like uh, financial problems. Mom and dad might have those in the family. Oh, it could be something even as, as, as simple as maybe at school you have a playmate who you're, you're having trouble with. They've been making fun of you. And you know, the more you think about it, the heavier that burden feels in your life. Well, Jesus said to us that we don't need to carry those burdens all by ourselves. that he is willing to come and to help us carry those burdens. In fact, the good news is that in our gospel today, Jesus says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. And then he went on to say, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus is willing to help us carry our burdens. Whatever problems, whatever things happen in our lives, Jesus is willing to carry those for us. And all we need to do is to remember to give the burdens to him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you 
for Jesus' willingness to carry our burdens. Help us to remember he is always there to help us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And now for the adults, let us pray. Heavenly Father, take the words of my mouth. Take the meditation of each and every heart <clears throat> that is here listening at this time. Take those hearts and those meditations and those words and make them all acceptable in your sight. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Houston Smith is a Methodist who has uh, long been an authority on world religions. And he was one of the many people of many faiths and from different countries who were asked to contribute an essay to a book that was called, How Can I Find God? Well, in his essay, <clears throat> Smith told this particular story. It seems that a disciple said to his master, how can I find God? And instead of answering the question, the master took the student and led him down to a nearby river. And standing there together in the river and after kind of staring out over the beauty of the water as it flowed down the banks there, the master grabbed the student and he pushed him pushed his head underneath the water, holding it there for more than several minutes while the student struggled to get free. Well, finally, the, the master let him go, and the student emerged from the water, of course, sputtering and gasping for, for air. And after a few minutes, the master said to the student, how did it feel down there? And the student stared angrily at the master and he replied, that was awful. I, I thought I was going to die. And the master smiled again and he said, when you want God as much as you wanted air, when you feel like you cannot live without God in your life, then you will find God. Or better put, then you will realize that God has already found you. I want to read the scripture again, or at least a few verses of it. But to what will I compare this generation? It is like children sitting in the marketplaces and calling to one another. We played the flute for you and you did not dance. We wailed and you did not mourn. For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say he has a demon. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, look, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of the tax collectors and sinners. Yet wisdom is vindicated by her deeds. I think Jesus' point uh, in this text is, is very, very simple. Uh, people, people are not really serious about finding God, so they avoid God by complaining about the messengers. The ones complaining about both John and Jesus in this text purport to be serious seekers after God, but what they are really looking for is a God made in their own image rather than the God whose image they have been made. They are seeking, you see, a religious experience that will fit uh, appropriately into uh, their lifestyle, um, a religious experience that will, that will, um, well, I guess you'd say that they could control, that they could regularize. Jesus would agree with the master, I think, in the story that I told a few moments ago, when, when people want a relationship with God as much as a drowning man wants air to breathe, when people believe that they will die without God, then the pettiness, the pettiness will cease and people will look around and they will discover God and his holiness all around them. Luke Timothy Johnson, in his book, Living 
living for Jesus. He points out that in Matthew, the character of, of Jesus is drawn in very, very sharp contrast, you see, to the scribes and the Pharisees and their particular way of approaching God. They have transformed. This is the scribes and the Pharisees. They have taken the, trans, the, the Torah and they have transformed this teaching from God, the reve revealed will of God, from a living and exciting invitation to holy living, and they've turned it into a heavy burden for the people to have to carry. They have expanded it into law after law, uh, long list which uh, of things, you know, what's clean, what's unclean, what they can do, what they can't do, exact formulas for ritual observance that everybody better follow to a T. They have turned God's word of steadfast love into a word of perpetual judgment <clears throat> and duty. The yoke of the law of working in the kingdom of God has become, in a sense, an albatross around their necks, weighing them down and holding them back. Now, the ancient Jews and scribes and Pharisees were not unique in this attempt to try to corral and control God. Uh, it, was, it was their effort, you see, to, to bring about some sort of orderness, uh, or, or order, I guess you would say, into the wilderness, the wildness, the chaos of God's way in the world, or at least that's what it appeared to them. And down through the years, we have habitually sought to also do the same thing, create systems by which we can assure ourselves we are all right, all right with each other and right with God. And none of it ever works in reality. At some point, all of our systems fail because you and I fail. No matter how cleverly we, we put a system of checks and balances together, there's always going to be a flaw in it. And you see, the flaw is you and me. It's us. Paul gives clear voice to this flaw in what is now a, a classic description of what of what the basic Lutheran prayer of confession refers to as uh, our bondage to sin. You recognize that. It's what we say in a confession. The problem with all the human ideas about how to be religious is not that they are failures of logic or are inconsistent systems of, of ethics or that they even ask too much of us. The problem is, as the comic strip character Pogo once said, we have met the enemy, and they are us. When Paul states in Romans, I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. And again, he says, I can will what is right, but I cannot do it. I think we are all in our heart of hearts, we are forced to nod with sad and rueful recognition that that's you and me too. Our behaviors, big or small, are very seldom, very seldom consistent with our better selves. And we, like Paul, long to know not only why, but how. How will how will we ever get off this endless cycle of failure and guilt? The promise of the gospel is that Jesus has come to rescue us from ourselves. In verses 25 through 30 of our gospel text, Jesus proclaims this, Come to me, all you that are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, 
and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. In the midst of our confusion and the despair that we can feel, God comes to us in the person of Jesus of Nazareth. God comes to us and he reminds us that the divine human encounter is controlled not by us, but by God. We do not find God through, through wisdom and intelligence, but rather God finds us. And God reveals God's self to us when helpless as a baby, we need and we want God the very same way we need and want air to breathe. So Jesus comes and he invites us to lay our burden down, to take up the yoke of the gospel with him. I wonder, I wonder what burden each of us might need to put down in order to be able to take on the yoke of Jesus, the very cross of Christ. A sin of our past, maybe, that haunts the present. Some doubt in our mind which continues to trouble our spirits. A feeling of inadequacy or unworthiness that keeps us from offering ourselves as a fellow laborer in the kingdom of God. Whatever it is, Jesus invites us to put it down, to lay it aside, to kick it to the curb as we accept his offer to share in the work of the kingdom, the work of telling the world about, about the the goodness and the love and the mercy and the compassion of our God. Take a deep breath. Feel the air fill your lungs. Take another deep breath and breathe God in. Let, let God fill your lungs with forgiveness and love and holiness. Come to me, all you that are weary and carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Amen. I now invite you to join me in prayer as we lift up our prayers from the church and for the world. Called into unity with one another and the whole creation, let us pray for our shared world. We pray for the church. Sustain us as we share your word and your meal. Embrace us as we struggle to find our common ground in Christ. Lift up servant leaders with powerful and prophetic voices. Free your people from faith that is stagnant. And we pray also for the well-being of creation. Protect the air, water, and land from abuse and pollution. Move us from apathy in our care of creation and direct us toward sustainable living. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the nations of the world. Guide all leaders in developing just policies and guide all difficult conversations with great wisdom. Enable the nations to work for justice and peace for all. Free us from patriotism that hinders relationship, relationship building and lead us to deeper love for our neighbor. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for all in need. We pray especially for those who suffer from coronavirus and those experiencing deep grief at the loss of loved ones. We pray that you will sustain those who work in the medical fields 
as they bear the burdens of our health pandemic. Show us how to take the yoke of Christ, that our burdens may be exchanged for his blessings. Give your consolation and free us from all that keeps us bound. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for this congregation. <clears throat> Bless all who lead and give them the Spirit's power for their task. Energize our ministries and all who serve. Give us your faithfulness in our work and the ability to trust your ways and your timing as we desire to worship together again. Help us to wait upon you knowing that you are working in our lives, in all things together, for our good. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And receive these prayers, O God, and those too deep for words, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And now receive this benediction. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you now and forever. Amen. Go in peace. Serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. God bless you and take care. I will see you soon.